Hey guys, this is Adam. When I started my own journey with Azure, I quickly became overwhelmed by the sheer amount of messaging services that were available to me. What I found the best work for me is learning each one after another. And for that reason, today we're gonna get introduction into big data messaging service in Azure called Azure Event Hubs. Stay tuned. I want to start with key characteristics when it comes to event hubs, first of all, this is a big data event streaming service. A streaming is a process where you're continuously sending data to your service. Second of all, it's scalable. And it's scalable both in size of the data that it can process, it goes up to terabytes of data, but also velocity, which is millions of events per second that it can process. And third, it's reliable. So there's no data loss because it is designed to be agnostic for failures. And lastly, even Hub supports multiple protocols and SDKs. So if you're using a standard HTTP or AMQP protocols, you're good to go. And if you're using any of the most common languages on the market, you have SDK available for you. So you don't have to learn the APIs for the Event Hub. When it comes to supported scenarios for Event Hubs, you can think of it like pretty much any scenario where you analyze a stream of data, be it anomaly detection, live dashboarding, transactional processing, or just archiving data. Event hubs are good for that. So let's talk about basics, because when working with event hubs, you're going to get introduced to quite a few new terms that you need to learn. First of all, we have event producers. Those are applications and services that will be sending your event data to the event hub through AMQP, which stands for Advanced Messaging Queuing Protocol, HTTP or Apache Kafka. Those services are your sources of your events. And those events are sent to Event Hub. Each Event Hub is partitioned. You can have from 1 to 32 partitions. I marked one as star because everywhere in documentation you're going to find information that the minimum is 2. Although if you're going to go to the portal, you will be able to choose minimum one partition and it's going to work just fine. You choose the number of partitions when creating Event Hub and it's not changeable after creation. So it's good to choose what kind of partitioning and how many partitions do you need beforehand. Otherwise, you're gonna need to recreate Event Hub later on. Second of all, when you start sending those messages, they will be load balanced across those partitions. There is no guarantee that the partitions will be utilized equally. So you should expect that each partition will grow at a different rate. When looking at the scope of each partition, each partition is ordered. So if you look at partition 4, all events in that partition are ordered from the oldest to the newest in that partition. It's just like a queue. But you should not expect that the order is maintained across partitions. In fact, it's not. So if you need to process multiple events in order, you need to introduce a partition key, which will allow you to specify a partition key for the events that you upload, making sure that they will land in the same partitions. And since the partition is ordered, they will be processed in order as well. You also have something called namespace. So if you have your event hub, that's a single event hub representing a unique stream of data. Let's call it event hub A. Then if you need to process a second unique stream of data containing different data, then you will create event hub B. And a logical container to create multiple event hubs is called namespace. This is pretty much what you're going to create in Azure portal. This is your scoping container that has multiple shared properties like shared throughput, shared cost, etc, etc. At this point, this is the moment where we can actually go to Azure portal and create ourselves an Invent Hub namespace. So I'm going to Azure portal where I'm going to press create resource and find Event Hub. Inside of Azure Marketplace, you're going to find Event Hubs, but when you press on it, it says Event Hubs. But in fact, what you're creating right now is Event Hub namespace. When you hit create, you're going to actually see create namespace on the top. So I'm going to choose my Azure Event Hub tutorial resource group, create a namespace, give it a name. I'm going to call it AM Demo. I'm going to choose location for North Europe and the pricing tier. In here you have two options, basic and a standard. Basic gives you one consumer group and standard gives you 20, which stands for how many unique applications will be reading entire stream of the data. We're gonna tackle that in a second, but for now, I'm gonna choose a standard pricing tier, which allows me to use 20 consumer groups. Next, you have throughput units 
and the throughput unit is simply set a performance unit of your event hub. So how many messages you can actually process using your event hubs. You can choose from 1 to 20 and this basically indicates the performance for your event hub. If you need more than 20, you can create a support request to increase this limit to 40 or you can create something called event hub dedicated clusters if you need even more performance. For our demo purposes, I'm just gonna leave it at 1. You can hit review and create and that's pretty much it. Hit create and in just a couple of minutes, your service will be ready to be used. After a minute or so our service has been deployed, we can go to the resource. And in here, this is our event hub namespace. It even says it on the top. So that means this is our logical container for the event hubs and we can start creating event hubs endpoints. In here you have a couple of shared properties like shared access signature, so your way of authorization and authentication to the namespace. You have scaling options so you can change those throughput units. One interesting option here is auto inflate. If you enable this, this is basically just another name for auto-scaling. So you can auto-scale your throughput units and allow it to raise from one to how many, depending on how many messages you are processing. This is pretty much the most cost-effective option. But if you need hard performance, that dedicated performance, then you're probably gonna choose throughput units. And of course, you have some additional options with geo-recovery, networking and stuff. So what we need to do right now is create entities, which are those event hubs. So as you saw the diagram, we need to create this one event hub, which will be our unique stream of data that we're gonna be using in this demo. So I'm gonna go to event hubs and create new event hub. You need to provide a name for your event hub. So I'm gonna call it my demo. And next you need to choose partition count. As you see, as I said, in the documentation, it says that two is minimum. You can clear, clearly see that it's one and it goes up to 32. For this demo, I'm just gonna choose one partition because I don't have a heavy processing that we'll be using. And you have message retention. So how many days your messages will be kept in event hub for processing? Because as I said, this is a stream of data and multiple applications might want to read the data. So you need to configure message retention and let know your event hub for how many days should it keep all the data in there. So if you have one day configured and the next day comes in and you start sending data over 24 hours, the old data will be removed periodically. It's just a sliding window. And you can go up to seven days for the standard tier. For the basic tier, it's just one day. Let's leave it at one and let's leave capture as off. I'm gonna talk about this feature in just a minute. So I'm gonna hit create. and my event hub is ready to go. As you see, you can create more here if you need, but that's pretty much it. So when it comes to demo, I want to show you how now can you grab this event hub and start outputting the data there. For this purpose, I will create a .NET application to do so. Let me go to Visual Studio Code where I'm gonna initialize a new application written in .NET Core. I will be copy pasting the code mostly so you don't have to know .NET per se to understand the demo because you will be able to choose your own language when you start developing using event hubs. So for the first part, I need to initialize a project and I'm gonna create new folder. The first one will be called 01 send events and I'm gonna open that in a terminal and I'm gonna initialize new project. First of all, I'm gonna create a console project using .NET new console, and I'm gonna add new packages to this project. This will be event hub, Azure Messaging Event Hubs and Azure Messaging Event Hubs Producer. I'm adding producer because I'm sending events, I'm producing all the events. And then of course, always it's good to run .NET restore to make sure that all the packages are downloaded. Once you do that, you will have initialized the project with a standard template for a .NET console application. As you see, there's not much here, so let's start adding things. First of all, we need to add usings. Using statement will allow us to use the packages like Azure Messaging, Azure Event Hub Messaging, Producer, Classes, etc, etc. I can enable extension because it's prompting me. And now we're good to go. 
So the first thing we need to do is create a connection string and even have name properties. So I'm going to paste it here. And as you see, I created two private properties, connection string and even have name. In here, I'm just going to copy paste my static main from the template because I don't want to focus on .NET SDK specifics, but I want to show you how powerful SDKs are and how easy it is to use them to upload events to Event Hub. I'll go now through the code just briefly to explain you what is happening. Let's hide the console and see more code. Since we created the two properties already, the first thing you need to do is create Event Hub Producer Client. This is your client for the Event Hubs. From there, from there I'm creating a batch data packages. So I'm going to be uploading multiple events into single batch and sending them as a single message to Event Hub. In this case, what I'm going to do is use try add method and pass the event data class and encode my data using UTF-8. This way I will send free events to the event hub. After that, it's just send async method to send events to event hub and I'll put something on the screen. Now that our application is ready, we need to grab the connection string and event hub name. We can go to Azure portal to grab the event hub name from here. This is my demo. Put it here as a property and then we need a connection string. To grab a connection string, there's a multiple ways. You can actually go to shared access policy and either use a default policy that is created on entire event hub namespace or better create a specific shared access policy for the event hub that you're working with. So if you're going to click here, add, you have options as you see, manage to manage entire event hub, send to send events and listen to read the events. So I'm going to use send and call it my sender. And once the policy is created, I can hit on it and grab connection string from here. So just copy the clipboard and paste my connection string here. Notice that in the end, it says entity path here to the specific entity hub that I created because I grabbed the connection string from the event hub itself. The second place where you can get it is if you revert back to your event hub namespace, you also have shared access policies here on the namespace. So this is the shared access policies across multiple event hubs. So if you want to create one connection string and upload data to multiple event hubs, then you can create shared access policy in here. If you want just specific, then do it on the event hub itself. Notice one thing, there's a root manage shared access key here. So this is the administrative key for entire event hub. All right, let's go to the code since we pasted it. We can actually save it and open console to build and run our application. To build application in .NET, just type .NET build and let it build. And I see I got error, but it's qu pretty quick fix. I forgot to remove this namespace for this demo because we're not using storage accounts in this case. So just save it and build it again. Once it's built, you can just type .NET run to run the application. And if everything works correctly, you will see message of contents, a batch of free events has been published. That means we already published free events using batch to event hub very quickly using .NET SDK. Once this is done, you can actually go back to Azure portal and start reviewing your metrics. You have two options to do so. You can either go to the overview of your event hub and review the namespace wide metrics. So those are the requests, messages and throughput across entire namespace. So you can review that here. And if you switch to messages, you're going to find the free messages that we are sending a moment ago. You can also review even hub specific metrics by going to even hubs panel, selecting your even hub. And in here, you're going to get all the metrics filtered down to the specific even hub. Let me also show you how easy it is to send events to event hub using Azure services like Azure Logic Apps. So let's go and type Logic Apps, open the panel, hit add. You can of course do the same by clicking here and create resource and searching marketplace for Logic Apps. Let's select Azure Event Hub tutorial and call it AM Demo Send Events. Choose the same region North Europe hit review and create and hit create. Once it's created, you can go to the resource. Instantly a designer will open. I will use when HTTP request is received to get the empty starting point for my logic app. I don't need any inputs. So I'm just going to close it 
and add a new step. In this step, I'm gonna use event hub connector. As you see, I already have it on the recent, but if you don't, just type event hub to find the connector for the event hubs. And then use action called send events. It will prompt you to create a connection name. So I'm gonna call my con and select the event hub that was found in my Azure subscription. In here, it will ask me to provide a policy. Remember the policy? This is the shared access signature token. And since I have only one right now, it asks me to use the administrative one across entire event hub. For the demo purposes, I'm gonna use it, but in production setting, remember to manage those shared access signature separately. So create one for each application that will be using it. Hit create. Once this is done, a connection to event hub is saved in our Azure resource group. Here, choose the my demo, the event hub name and add a parameter. So in which case you can provide a content. A content will be a small message that we can send to event hub like hello world and maybe randomized name by using expression and typing rand from one to 10,000. So this will send hello world and a random number to our event hub. You can just save it, run it and see results. The result was successful. We are able to send our event to event hub and the connector does the encoding automatically for us. So we don't really have to do anything. Using logic apps to send events to event hub is fairly easy. Although since the event hubs are designed for big scale, I would not use logic apps because they might be quite expensive. Use maybe Azure functions instead. I just wanted to show you how easily can you integrate. Now we can switch back to presentation to talk about next topic. One thing to note is that when we created event hub namespace, we really registered an FQDN called name of your namespace dot service bus dot windows dot net. This is not a typo because event hub is from the same service family as service bus. And this is the URL that you're gonna be referring to your service bus in a connection strings. With that covered, we can go to the next section, which is receiving messages. There are a couple of things when it comes to event consumers. So the services that will be grabbing the information from the event hubs. First of all, there's a consumer group. We briefly seen that when we were creating the namespace for the event hub, we were able to choose from one to 20, depending on the pricing tier. And think of a consumer group like a unique view of event hub data. What does it really mean? It means that each consumer group can have a separate view of our entire event hub data. They can read the entire hub data separately. Usually this means that each consumer group will be a separate application. And the consumers are processes within a consumer group that will be reading events of an event hub using AMQP protocol. Ideally, you're gonna have as many consumers as partitions to allow for very good scaling, but it is still possible to have more consumers than partitions in which case each consumers will be reading from the same partition. This is possible, although not recommended, because in that case, you will need to handle the duplicate data processing yourself. And another thing we need to learn here is an offset. An offset is a position of an event within a partition. So each event in a partition has an offset and that offset can be saved across multiple partitions. So each consumer will know where is it currently processing the data and process of saving the offset is called checkpointing and it's done on a client side. So each client must save the offset that is currently processing on a client side if they want to continue. Creating this checkpointing mechanism allows you to have more reliability when using event hubs, because if the consumer dies, if the process dies, then you're gonna start from the very last offset that you finish processing. This process is quite important when it comes to scalability because if you're processing and your partitions have millions of events or even hundreds of millions of events, if your process dies, you don't want to read all of those messages again. So every now and then you checkpoint where you finished and save the process. It's just saving state of your current processing and committing the changes somewhere. Remember, this is done on a client side. So if you're using SDK, then you have that feature out of the box. You just provide a connection string to Azure Blob Storage and your SDK will manage checkpointing for you. You just need to call a method. And as I said, since the consumer group is just a view on the data and application, a logical application, you can have multiple consumer groups in which each consumer group will have its own view of the data, saving its own offsets by managing their own checkpointing mechanism. 
One thing to note here is that remember that event hub contains data for several days from one to seven, so that each consumer needs to process its own data within that time period. With that said, we can move to the second demo about receiving data from event hubs. So let's actually move back to portal, but in the end, we're gonna end up in Visual Studio. Again, I'm gonna use .NET SDK to create receive events application. Let me quickly create new folder for our new application. Okay, there's no typo. We can open this in terminal to be sure that we are in the right place. Now I'm gonna initialize my project by copy pasting .NET new console to create new console application and .NET add package for my Azure messaging event hubs and again Azure messaging event hub processor so that we have all the packages needed to run the project for receiving data. Lastly, run .NET restore to be sure all the packages are in place. Now close this old program and open program CS for our second application. So in here, first of all, I'm gonna add using statements and notice that in a using statement, there's Azure storage blob. This is actually in this case required because as I said, there's a process of checkpointing. So each consumer group needs to save a checkpoint whenever they're processing data. And to save that checkpoint, we're gonna use SDK feature, which will save the checkpoint on Azure blob storage. So the first thing we need to do in order to use checkpointing, remember to add a package for Azure Blob Storage by adding .NET add package Azure Storage Blobs. Once you do it, you can actually start using Blob Storage SDKs as well. But you won't have to because everything is done underneath the scenes for you by the Event Hubs SDK. So for this demo, you will need four properties in this case. So you need properties connection string Event Hub name like previously but additionally blob storage connection string and container name where the checkpoints will be saved. Again, in this case, I'm just copy pasting the code for my static main so that I can actually explain you what does the SDK do and what does it provide and additional two methods to process and handle errors. In which case, I'm just gonna save it, close the terminal for a second so we get a bit more real estate. Before we fill everything in, let me show you what is happening here. First of all, you're creating a consumer. For the consumer group, notice that I grab the default consumer name group, which in case is a dollar default. If you go to Azure portal to your resource group, let's go to Azure portal, select the resource group, Azure event hub tutorial, your event hub namespace, go to event hubs, my demo, and this is the place where you can configure consumer groups for your event hub. On the left hand side panel in consumer groups blade, you can open it to find a default consumer group. Every event hub always has a default consumer group. And by stating this line here, basically says I'm a default client for this event hub. It's fine. If you want, you can create more consumer groups or not. You can leave it at this. Second of all, you create a blob container client. This client is actually passed to the event processor client as a parameter, which will use this client to save the checkpointing information on a blob storage. Then you add two event handlers for processing the events, this is the method below, and for handling errors during the processing. And just simply run await processor start processing async. In this demo, I will close it early, so this will pretty much run this process for 10 seconds, receive all the messages, and it will stop processing. One important thing to note what is happening here is that we have process event handler. And this process event handler will grab the event from the event hub, give it a message, received event and the content of the event, and decode the event data. And then the important stuff here is update check bond async. So this call we'll make sure to update the blob storage with the current offset where we're finished processing. As you see in this demo, I will be updating checkpoint every single message that I will process. But in real case scenario, usually updating checkpoints is done in the time based intervals, like maybe every five minutes, but it still depends on the use case. So you have to decide how you're gonna be updating checkpoints yourself. And in cases of errors, we're just gonna throw some issue information on the screen. If this works correctly, we can open a console to type .NET build. But before we do that, 
Remember, we didn't fill out those settings. So first of all, let's grab connection string. We can actually grab connection string and even hub from our first example. So let's grab this and paste it here. All right, so now we just need blob connection string and blob container information. So let's go back to Azure portal, to our resource group and open storage account. I created the storage account beforehand and now I'm gonna create a container. I already have a container called demo so I can reuse it. Maybe I'm just gonna call it checkpoints. I'm gonna copy that name and create container called checkpoints. Which case, in this case, I'm gonna paste this checkpoints as a blob container name. So the last missing piece is the blob storage connection string. So you can go to access keys and grab the connection string from here. Just copy to clipboard and paste that string here. Remember not to leave those connection strings in the production application, but for the demo purposes, it's fine. If this works fine, we can just run .NET build and .NET run. As you see, we've got an error. And the reason for this error is because we reuse the connection string, although the policy that we created was called my sender and it only had the properties that allow it to send messages, not listen to it. So a quick fix for this is to create new shared access policy that allows us to listen to events, to read the events as the name suggests in the error below. So to fix that, go back to Azure portal, to your event hub, my demo, open the shared access policies. And remember we had my sender with only send claims. So we need to call my receiver with listen, which will allow it to read the messages of the event hub. Once you do it, just pre press my receiver and copy the connection string. Now we can actually use this connection string instead, which will allow it to read the messages of an event hub. So let's try this again, rebuild the application and run it again. And the result is here. As you see, we've got two events from the logic app, hello world with two random numbers and three events from our .NET application. The reason why we have two events from the logic app because I was running once again in a background to ensure everything was working properly, but I didn't record this part. So this is perfect. We were able to receive all the events asynchronously using SDK from the event hubs fairly easy. You can go back to portal and you can always review what is happening if you want in those metrics section. But now we can actually go back to our presentation and talk about few last features of the event hubs. So first of all, what are the additional features that you get? There's something called event capture. So if you cannot process your events within one day, or you might want to have a long-term retention of your events, event hub delivers you a feature called event capture. If you go to Azure portal, to your event hub, the event capture can be found on the event hubs. So remember to navigate to your event hub and the capture is on the features on the left hand side blades. When you go here, it allows you to select this. Remember, we were also able to select capture when we were creating event hub for the first time. So when you select on, as you see, it asks you, so what is the time interval that you're going to be creating dumps? And what is the size window in case your size of the partition of the data grows beyond some limit, it will start saving data to blob storage. So this basically will grab the data from your event hub and save it permanently on Azure blob storage. In this case, I'm going to select for the demo purposes one minute size window, something very small, but it doesn't matter since the window it's either or. And you can select if you want, do not emit empty files if no events occurred. This way, if you don't send any events within the time period of this time window selected above, then it would normally create an empty file. So you can select to not do that. Capture provider is Azure storage account or data lake storage generation one. Select the container. You can actually select from your uh, subscription. In this case, I'm selecting my AZ event hub demo and a demo container. Select it. 
Notice that you can also select what is the pattern for naming folders in, in which case on blob there are no folders but it will look like so. So you can change that pattern here and simply save changes. Now that you do it, every single event that will go through event hub will be saved to Azure Blob Storage for long-term retention or maybe other processing purposes like maybe some batch processing using any other tool like Data Factory or maybe uh, Databricks. There's plenty of tools that can do that. So after a minute passed, you can uh, go back to your resource group, open storage count, go to the containers and open demo container. And if the time period already lasted, you can actually see AM demo, which is the name of our namespace, my demo, the name of event hub, and driving down by the date to your dumps in Avro format. Avro is Apache format for data in very effective formats for saving data. Just good to know that Azure Data Factory supports this format, so it's fairly easy to start integrating this format with any other tool, any other system in Azure out of the box. So we can now go back to our presentation. What else do you get? You also get auto scaling feature with auto inflate. We were talking about this briefly. So you can auto scale your throughput units to be able to periodically process more events and still get as most cost effective solution as possible. And lastly, in case of geo disaster, you can actually do recovery with geo replication into another region. So you can have highly redundant, highly available applications running on event hubs in Azure. Now that we're done with our demo, you can see that event hubs are fairly easy to integrate. It's easy to send and receive messages out of it, and also easy to integrate with other Azure services. It's up to you to decide whenever your application fix a big data streaming scenario or not. But for today, that's it. Hit a thumbs up, leave a comment and subscribe if you want to see more, and definitely see you next time.